What's up everyone, Pags here at MEI Studio. This week we're going to look at a mic that's been hanging around for over 30 years now. The mic isn't particularly exceptional by today's standards, though from what I've read and heard, the newer versions might slightly be a bit better. But its contribution to the home recording revolution that happened in the 90s is significant. We're talking about the AKG C1000S. Before we get into it, if you've been watching these videos and haven't subscribed yet, please do. It'll help us grow and continue to create new content for everyone, and please hit that like button as well. If you were born before the 80s, and I guess even the early 80s, you got to see a lot of things firsthand. Technologically speaking, you bore witness to one of the steepest upticks of progress human beings have ever experienced. We saw electronics get smaller and smaller and cheaper and cheaper. We saw the dawn of the information age with home internet becoming commonplace. If you were involved in music or music production, sampling, synthesis, and the birth of the MIDI standard caused a huge explosion in music production taking place outside of a proper recording studio. We saw the rise of the home studio with advances in multi-track recorders on cassette and cheaper reel-to-reel -reel units. Mackie brought in large format console functionality to a way more compact and way cheaper package. The channel strip outboard unit was born, then digital recording entered the chat and major studios received their death warrant. Pretty much everything we take for granted in recording now blossomed between 1980 and 2000. It was during this boom that we started to see advances in microphone technology that brought the high fidelity of condenser microphones into the price range where musicians, aspiring engineers and producers could get their hands on a mic that didn't make instruments and vocals sound like there was a wet blanket over them. In 1981, AKG's microphone catalog featured three large diaphragm condenser microphones along with a few small diaphragm condensers. By contrast today, there are currently 10 large diaphragm condensers in AKG's catalog and five SDCs and a few others aimed at the casting market. In the early 80s, the only other real games in town were Neumann, Telefunken, and a couple of others if they were even attainable by the average consumer. 1988 saw a shift in potential for the home recording enthusiast. A ham slash installation mic company out of Ohio, A-Static, decided to try their hand at a more studio or pro grade of mic at a price point that wasn't astronomical. They named the pro line Conduit Audio Devices and what we all know as CAD was born, and so were high quality home recordings. That same year, AKG decided to put out a small diaphragm condenser mic that was also equally attainable by us mortals. The C1000S was unveiled. We now had a quality large diaphragm condenser for vocals from CAD and small diaphragm condensers from AKG for instruments. And vocals, I guess, but I don't know anyone that ever really used the C1000 for vocals, just saying. Around the same time, Tascam were putting out multi-track cassette recorders and a new company that consisted of former TAP co-founders started Mackie Designs. We now had inexpensive consoles, mics, and recorders. The home recording revolution had begun. With digital recording becoming the norm at the end of the 90s and early aughts, home recording quality was quickly approaching that which could be attained by professional studios. To date, there have been at least three revisions to the C1000S. The first was all black and featured an on-off switch and was powered by either a 9-volt battery or 48-volt phantom power. The mic was updated years later in the late 90s to a silver bronze color to match some of the new budget-friendly offerings, the C2000, 3000, and 4000. The pair we have in the studio is from this era. The mic was again updated in 2012. The newer mic, which is still available today, features some internal switches for a high-pass filter and negative 10 dB pad and has an LED on the power switch. In addition, the optional 9-volt battery was changed to use two AA batteries instead. The second and third versions also had little accessories that came with the mics that, when attached, would alter the pickup pattern or the high frequencies, almost like a little presence booster. These little plastic caps would fit over the capsule and would require a little manhandling to get on and off. I've long since lost the ones that came with the original mic, and I've resorted to copying the design and 3D printing replacements, which work exactly like the originals. And they never go on the mic, exactly like the originals. Although the mics never met rave reviews, for the home audio enthusiasts, they were a step into the world of high fidelity capture, the likes of which were just not attainable with standard dynamic microphones. 
with the exception maybe of the Sennheiser 441, but that one dynamic mic sold for more than the price of a pair of C1000S's. The design of the mic has been copied by a number of other manufacturers over the years, most notably the Rode M3. It's got the same head basket, port, hmm. We've put our pair over some drums in an XY pattern, in front of an acoustic guitar, and over our player piano. Let's get to the demo. All right. Are these the best mics out there? No, clearly not. Uh, they aren't even in the top 20 of our collection here, but I will say when I was getting started in the late 90s, these mics were definitely an advantage for my little project studio. They were the de facto drum overheads for years, probably until close to 2010. As the studio grew and our mic collection started to get out of hand, we had switched to other things like a pair of custom mod tube mics by some guy named Royer. And finally, those are retired and we got our R88 Mark II. It's going to be a cold day when that mic gets retired. I digress. The C1000S is a part of not only my studio's history, but many small home studios' history as well. We all owe a bit of gratitude to these mics for their part in ringing in the new age of home recording, which we all enjoy today. Without companies like CAD, AKG, and later Marshall, which you may know as MXL, and Rode, the capture side of things for our studios might look and sound a heck of a lot different. What did you think of their sound? For a mic that's been around for over 30 years and still selling today, do they still stand up? I should note that the price of these has come down over the years as well. I got my pair for just under 600 USD back in the late 90s or early 2000s. A new pair can be had for under $500 today. The original and our second gen versions can be found regularly for between $100 and $150 or even less depending on condition. One word of caution, the older versions may have had foam rot inside the head baskets as the windscreens they had in them did start to deteriorate after decades. If you're looking to buy used and you're able to, make sure the foam hasn't broken down and adhered itself to the capsule. If you've gotten anything from today's video, hit that like and subscribe button. It'll really help us out. If you're interested in studio mics and other things audio related, hit that notify button so you'll be notified when we put up a new video. Well, that's it for this time. This is Pags, signing off.